The Allied bombing campaign of World War II began in 1939. At first, it was just an ineffectual pecking around the perimeter of enemy defenses. It grew slowly for the first three years, then accelerated in late 1944 and early 1945. At the end of the war, it reached a degree of frightfulness the world had never dared to contemplate. In pre-war conventional wisdom, 40 or 50 tons of bombs were considered enough to destroy London or Paris. By the end of World War II, the combined efforts of the Royal Air Force Bomber Command and the United States Strategic Air Forces it rained down almost three million tons of bombs on Axis targets. Of this amount, 85% was dropped after June 1, 1944. The escalation was massive. It only became possible when the Allied Air Forces and the logistics systems had reached the size to fight a genuine air war. The United States Army Air Corps intended that a modern bomber would be able to force its way through enemy fighter squadrons without excessive losses. Then, with its secret Norton bombsite, it would carry out precise bombing attacks. The British belief in precision daylight bombing was shattered by a high attrition rate. Britain was to learn that it did not have the equipment or the skill for precision night bombing either. By the time that lesson was clear, the events of the war and the momentum built up for Bomber Command dictated that bombing had to go on in the only way it could, night area bombing. Some people argue that there are degrees of morality in bombing. They say that area bombing is more immoral than the precision bombing advocated by the United States. But in the realities of World War II, precision bombing was usually a goal impossible to attain. The question was not, do we bomb precisely, but do we bomb at all? When the Americans arrived in Europe, the British tried to dissuade them from the idea of daylight precision bombing, but American doctrine and equipment were dedicated to that task. They could not readily be converted to night work. To the dismay of the Americans, the bad weather over the continent meant that precise daylight bombing was impossible. The 8th Air Force had to rely on technical equipment that had been developed for blind bombing. The result was that, contrary to popular belief, the American effort was largely an area bombing campaign. Precision daylight bombing would have been preferred by British and American leaders. It would have meant easier navigation, better target identification, more harm to the enemy, and less need for a return trip. But even the most well-intended bombing meant a shower of bombs from a moving mass that could not be less than 1,800 feet wide. Bombs could easily be released too soon or too late, 5,000 feet or more off target. Then there was the weather and the German countermeasures from fighters to electronics. Instead of bombing as they wished, the Allies had to bomb as they could. For the most part, this meant area bombing. Before the war, most leaders thought that bombing civilian targets would be an effective war-winning strategy. But no one had any idea of the immense effort required to conduct a successful bombing campaign. 
Nor did they realize the tremendous resilience and strength possessed by a modern industrial country like England or Germany or the endurance of their populations. On July the 8th, 1940, just as the Battle of Britain was building, Winston Churchill wrote that he could see only one path to winning the war. An absolutely devastating, exterminating attack on the Nazi homeland. We must be able to overwhelm him by this means, without which I do not see a way through. When the Germans invaded the Soviet Union on June the 22nd, 1941, Churchill promised Stalin that he would visit a terrible winter of bombing on Germany. The night bombing offensive was accelerated. It was the only thing Churchill could or wanted to offer Russia in the form of a second front. But two political elements intervened to prevent air power from defeating Germany by itself. As the bombing offensive built in intensity, the United States eclipsed Britain in strength and began to dictate the course of the war. The American leadership wanted to invade the continent. The British leadership did not. There was also the growing realization that an invasion was necessary to contain the Russians in Eastern Europe. This was an often overlooked influence on the bombing campaign. An invasion required air superiority. The only way to get air superiority was to defeat the German air force in the air and on the ground. The only way to do that was by bombing critical targets. The British learned the hazards of daylight bombing in one mission. On December the 18th, 1939, 24 Vickers Wellington twin-engine bombers made an armed reconnaissance of Wilhelmshaven in Germany. The Wellingtons were the best RAF bombers of the time. German fighters shot down 10 Wellingtons into the sea, two more ditched, and three crashed on landing. The lesson was clear. Unescorted aircraft could not bomb in daylight and live. British training and doctrine were destroyed at a stroke. Very little effort had been devoted to night navigation or bombing. Few crews were capable of finding the large Ruhr region in the dark, let alone a city or a factory. Yet the war had to be fought. The British turned to night raids, and they did amazingly well, at least according to their reports. Bomb doors open. Bomb doors open. Left, left. Steady. Reports were made of great fires caused by the rains. Wishful thinking translated tons of bombs dropped into acres of destroyed factories. The crews believed their reports. RAF leaders based further actions on them. Churchill directed his war economy to the service of a massive bombing campaign. In autumn 1940, Air Chief Marshal Sir Charles Portal became chief of the air staff. Portal created a plan for Target Force E. 4,000 bombers were to win the war by killing 1 million Germans and making 25 million homeless. I hope we haven't kept you waiting, sir. Good Lord, now. Come sit down. But aircrew were optimists. This was reflected in reported accuracy in bombing, in the numbers of aircraft shot down, and in the effect on enemy actions. 
bombers were dropped at 2350B. Uh, As a result, Air Force reports came to be discounted and ignored to the point that any real efficiency of the bombing was never appreciated. Yes, that was the big one. Yes, there was a smasher right onto it. Caused a hell of a great big fire. Buckets of smoke. Visible 50 miles away. In August 1941, D.M.B. Butt of the British War Cabinet Secretariat was asked to make a statistical analysis of the results of British bombing in Germany. Butt's report was shattering. It revealed that, on average, only one in three aircraft of those attacking got within five miles of the target. Butt reported that bombing was severely affected both by ambient light and weather. On a moonlit night, the overall average was two in five reaching within five miles. On a moonless night, it degraded to one in 15. The RAF, particularly Bomber Command, refused to believe the report. But the facts were indisputable. The RAF did not possess the means to navigate to the target area. Nor did it have the means to bomb accurately if the target were found. On the night of November the 7th, 1941, 400 aircraft were dispatched to attack targets from the Ruhr in Germany to Oslo in Norway. The entire attack was a disaster. Many aircraft were lost. Few completed their attacks. The damage to targets like Berlin was minimal. Many aircraft ran out of fuel and had to ditch. Air Marshal Pierce, the head of Bomber Command, blamed the weather and inexperienced crews. After two years of warfare, this was an unacceptable admission. Pierce had to go. He was replaced by Air Chief Marshal Arthur Harris. This war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. After Rotterdam, London, Warsaw... Harris was a good friend of Portal, and Churchill also took a liking to him. Harris was big, gruff, and outgoing. He had a fighting instinct that Churchill always admired. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. Now, there's your plug and lead. Right, thank you. Operations tonight, fellas. How do you know? Oh, I'll get around, I'll get all the gen. Harris found Bomber Command in sad shape. It only had 378 serviceable aircraft and crews. Only 69 of these aircraft were heavy bombers. British heavy bomber production had so far failed miserably. New models were having development problems. The three principal Royal Air Force medium bombers were workmanlike examples of the first generation of modern, all-metal enclosed cockpit aircraft. What they lacked in sophistication, they made up for in good old aerodynamic virtues. The Vickers Wellington made its first flight on June the 15th, 1936. It was the principal RAF bomber until the four-engined heavies came along. It had a range of 2,200 miles and could carry 4,500 pounds of bombs. It was a remarkable aircraft for its time, but far from adequate for Harris's needs. Wellington was supplemented by two smaller aircraft. The Handy Page Hampton was nicknamed the Frying Pan because of its unusual tail boom arrangement. The other was the Armstrong Whitworth Whitley, affectionately called the Flying Barn Door because of its slab sides. In order to help shorten its takeoff run, the Whitley's wing was given a very high angle of incidence. As a result, the Whitley flew in a peculiar nose down attitude. In October 1938, the British Air Ministry began Programme L, calling for the delivery of 3,500 heavy bombers 
by April 1942. Program L called for 1,500 short Stirlings, 500 Handley Page Halifaxes, and 1,500 Avro Manchesters. The Stirling first flew on May the 14th, 1939. It entered combat on February the 10th, 1941, with an attack on Rotterdam. In spite of its clumsy appearance, it was highly maneuverable, but it had a limited ceiling that made its operations increasingly hazardous as anti-aircraft fire improved. It was used in bombing raids until September 1944. The Handley Page Halifax was the second bomber of Program L. It would make up 40% of Bomber Command's strength at the height of the bomber offensive. The third bomber in Program L was the Avro Manchester. Like the Halifax, it was planned with two engines, and when they proved unreliable, it was redesigned with four Rolls-Royce Merlins. The revised model was named the Lancaster and became the best British bomber of the war. It was a handsome aircraft with a top speed of 287 miles an hour. Its bomb capacity was its major feature. It could carry a normal load of 14,000 pounds. An American B-17 could carry 4,000. Eventually, the Lancaster would be modified to carry the 22,000 pound Grand Slam the heaviest bomb of the war. The Lancaster was rushed into production even before its first flight. It gave Arthur Harris the plane he needed for bomber command. He bought it in quantity. Eventually, almost seven and a half thousand would be built. The Lancaster was a highly capable aircraft. But it would have been little more than useless without the navigation and bombing equipment that allowed it to deliver its huge load to the proper targets. I want to impress upon you that this equipment is most secret and completely new. From the telecommunications research establishment laboratories would come a major series of developments to assist in navigation and bombing. One was called G. The letter G referred to the grid map used with the system. Originally, it was developed as an aid to instrument landings. It permitted a navigator to determine his position easily and accurately without making any transmissions from his aircraft that might reveal its position. It consisted of three ground transmitters, far apart from each other, transmitting pulse signals simultaneously. It was a tremendous improvement over conventional navigation systems, but the curvature of the Earth limited its range to about 350 miles, and the Germans soon learned to jam it. The aircraft flies out onto this track and is controlled along it by means of dots and dashes, rather like this. Oboe was a ground-to-air blind bombing system. Two ground stations calculated the range and track of the aircraft. They guided the pilot by musical notes that sounded like an oboe. It was used successfully for the first time in February 1943. This rotating aerial is part of a new radar system called H2S. H2S was an airborne intercept radar. A radar scanner carried within the aircraft gave a rough picture of the terrain below. When features were quite distinct, like a shoreline, the picture was easy to interpret. Some navigators were better than others in interpreting the subtle signals of H2S. It required a special sort of personality, the 1940s equivalent of today's computer hacker. It's the estuary at Bremerhaven. The brighter area surrounding it, the land, and the brightest bit of all at the bottom, the town itself. After the Battle of Britain, the RAF continued to build its fighter defenses. At the time, most German fighter activity had moved to the Soviet Union. The RAF found itself in the embarrassing position of having a large and powerful force not being actively employed.
Missions were undertaken to force the Luftwaffe to fight. Some sweeps called rhubarb were made by fighters only. Others, called circuses, were combined fighter and bomber missions. In the summer of 1941, rhubarbs and circuses melded into what the British called a non-stop offensive. But the Germans could elect to fight or not. German radio and radio intelligence services gave ample warning of incoming RAF flights. They could be met by an appropriate force. The new Messerschmitt BF-109 fighters were an equal match to the intruding Spitfires. The new Fokker Wolf FW-190 was clearly superior. It was the only Luftwaffe fighter to use a radial engine. It was about 30 miles an hour faster than the Spitfire 5, up to 25,000 feet. It had the fastest roll rate of all fighters in World War II. British fighters were badly needed in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia. Veteran RAF pilots were sent to fill that need. That left less experienced pilots to fight the seasoned Luftwaffe veterans. British offensives failed miserably. Through 1943, the Luftwaffe achieved an almost four to one victory ratio. Britain would probably have stopped the attacks, but something needed to be done to take the pressure off the Russians on the Eastern Front. The RAF was forced to continue a campaign that it would gladly have halted. The main result of the RAF offensive was the gradual improvement in German defenses by the spring of 1942. Freya early warning radars were placed all along the coast. They were supplemented by an increasingly expert radio intercept service. There was another chain of Freya stations well inland. The science of night flying had been neglected in Germany. Germany relied almost entirely on FLAK, anti-aircraft fire, for air defense at night. The pre-war German searchlights, target predictors and guns were excellent for their time. The FLAK units were considered to be an elite. The Germans believed that FLAK could put up an almost impenetrable shield against intruding aircraft. But British incursions over Germany soon made it apparent that night fighters were necessary. In July 1940, Oberst Josef Kamhuber was given command of the new 1st Night Fighter Division in Brussels. His night fighters and searchlights were linked by radars to a ground control. The fighters could be controlled and vectored to the incoming bombers, which were illuminated by the searchlights. The concept was called Helle Nachtjacht, illuminated night fighting. It made maximum use of existing equipment to match the British Bomber Command's potential. By early 1943, the Messerschmitt Bf 110 came into its own as a night fighter. They bore the brunt of the night fighting through 1943. By the summer of 1943, the system had acquired a deadly expertise. The FLAC and the radar-controlled searchlights were feared by all the bomber crews. The American Eighth Air Force in Britain consisted of a bomber command and a fighter command. In February 1942, it had six men and no airplanes. By June 1944, 
it would have 400,000 officers and men and 8,000 aircraft. The growth was only possible through the generosity and courtesy of the Royal Air Force, which put everything from quarters to secretaries to laborers at America's disposal. The buildup of the 8th was limited both by slow arrival of aircraft and their reassignment to other theaters. General Ira Aker tried to get the maximum effect from them. He sent all that he had available whenever weather made daylight precision bombing possible. For the most part, the bombing targets were in the occupied territories. The first 8th Bomber Command raid on Germany took place on January 27, 1943. The target was Wilhelmshaven. Bombing was not particularly effective, nor were the German defenses. But this minor effort was the start of a campaign that would bring Germany to its knees. For the next 30 months, the 8th Air Force fought the best the Germans had to offer in the way of fighters and flak. For most of that time, it was criticized for not doing enough. The critics at the top were unaware of the massive difficulties of getting crews trained for combat in bombing, formation flying, and gunnery. Maintenance was another problem. At one point, 49% of Acre's planes were grounded because of a shortage of spare parts, tools, and air crews. The weather was bad. Sometimes it allowed only five bombing days a month. Weather became increasingly important as the numbers of aircraft grew. By 1944, as many as 2,000 aircraft would be taking off to climb through the clouds over England with only the most primitive procedures to avoid collisions. There were many. The February 16, 1943 raid on Saint-Nazaire showed early on just how difficult daylight precision bombing was. Sixty-five bombers attacked the submarine pens. Six were shot down, and two more were lost in a collision. At that loss rate, the total force would be wiped out in just eight missions. On a 25-mission tour of duty, a 4% loss rate would mean that statistically, no one would live to complete the tour. Even if the loss rate dropped to only 2%, the crews had only a 50% chance of surviving. But by early 1943, the 8th Air Force was averaging an 8% loss rate. Two fighters, 6 o'clock up, coming in, diving out, Chief. He said he'd be in trouble out at 2 o'clock watching. An engine on fire. This meant that on average, no one could expect to complete his 13th mission. There's two more diving through the 94. Three planes, 9 o'clock, coming around. Keep your eye on the board. Coming around the 10. Watch them, Chuck. Keep your eyes open. They're breaking at 11. Breaking at 11. I got them. Coming around underneath at 10 o'clock. The situation demanded new leaders and new tactics. Both emerged. 3 o'clock. Motor smoke. Colonel Curtis E. LeMay was only 35 years old. He was a brilliant leader. His laconic manner and ability to make hard decisions earned him the nickname Iron Ass. He was the commander of the 305th Bomber Group. LeMay insisted on intense training. He personally supervised it, flying in the top turret of a B-17 and calling out instructions to his aircraft commanders. With Brigadier General Lawrence Cooter, LeMay developed the combat box and combat wing formations. They were intended to intensify defensive firepower and improve bombing accuracy. 
Each combat box had 18 to 21 bombers in a group. Three groups formed a combat wing. The lead group flew slightly ahead of the other two. Another flew 1,000 feet higher and to one side. The third flew 1,000 feet lower to the other side. With 54 bombers in a formation, an attacking German fighter would be covered by up to 540 machine guns. LeMay selected the best bombardiers and navigators to fly with highly trained crews and lead the missions. Instead of each aircraft bombing separately, now all the aircraft in the formation dropped when the lead crew did. This ensured a far higher average accuracy. LeMay's insistence that the last minutes of a bomb run be flown straight and level gave the German gunners a more predictable target, but bombardiers could stabilize their sights and bombing targets were hit more frequently than in the past with greater accuracy. Success in precision bombing in spring 1943 relieved the pressure to convert to night bombing. But in the next nine months, the 8th would grow slowly and suffer terrible losses. The Luftwaffe was learning too. As its strength and skills grew, the 8th's air force would be defeated in the skies over Germany. Meanwhile, in May 1942, Bomber Harris sought his first great victory for Bomber Command in the 1,000 aircraft area bombing raid against the German city of Cologne. Harris's intention was as much to impress his critics in England as his enemy in Germany. He knew that the public was thirsting for a victory. Harris had already damaged the German cities of Lübeck and Rostock in March and April. Josef Goebbels' propaganda machine called for retribution against English cultural centers. By desperate efforts, straining all of Bomber Command's resources, Harris mustered 1,043 aircraft. More than half were Wellingtons, but he also had some of the new four-engine bombers, the Halifaxes, Lancasters, and Stirlings. Thirty-five percent of the aircraft were manned by instructors and students from the operational training units. This was a risk. If training crews were destroyed, the bomber offensive would be set back for a year until they were built up again. Night of May the 30th, 1942, the weather was good from takeoff to landing. The chosen target, Cologne was bathed in moonlight. Harris used saturation tactics. Within 90 minutes, 898 aircraft dropped more than 1,500 tons of bombs on the ancient city. Enormous fires were started. They continued to rage until the following day. More than 600 acres of the city were destroyed. Harris had achieved his aims. His opponents in Parliament were silenced. In the long run, England's resources were tipped towards Harris's mission. One third of Great Britain's manufacturing effort went to support the bomber offensive.
By the time major doubts about the effectiveness and morality of area bombing surfaced again, it was too late. After Cologne, there was no turning back. The British Empire was committed to Harris's strategy. The German reaction to the raid was ineffective. Hermann Göring refused to believe the damage reports. If they were correct, it meant that his defenses had failed. It also meant that the RAF had reached a strength unattainable by the Luftwaffe. Göring told Hitler that only 70 planes had been involved and 40 of them had been shot down. But Hitler soon found out the truth and Göring's fall from grace was accelerated. The devastation in Cologne was tremendous. Intense photo reconnaissance was conducted to see what could be learned. The photos showed that each ton of high explosive destroyed about one and three quarter acres of built up property. But each ton of incendiary bombs destroyed three and a quarter acres. There were two other thousand bomber raids in the next month, but they could not be sustained. For Bomber Command, the raids masked the underlying problem of aerial bombing. The Allied leaders continued to confuse the results of a raid with its effectiveness. In all these raids, the result was obvious destruction and damage. But in fact, the early bombing all the way through the war to the middle of 1943 had little effect on German production and less upon morale. In many of the cities struck, production of war materials was back to normal within a few days. In some cases, patriotic resentment would drive production levels higher. In this climate of overestimation of results, there was a failure to make repeat raids. Hard-hit targets were left alone to recover. The bombers turned their attention elsewhere. As the efficiency of German night fighting increased, it made the British raids more and more costly. But even as Harris took satisfaction in the damage to German cities and began a fateful assault on Berlin, the German night fighter force was preparing to win a victory in the spring of 1944. All through 1943, the Eighth Air Force continued to grow. But there was a growing cost to its operations as the 8th plunged forward into Germany without an adequate long-range fighter escort. In July, 128 four-engine bombers were shot down. 1,280 crewmen were removed from the war. The cost to Germany was only 40 fighters. Twenty-five to 50 percent of all aircraft returning from a deep penetration of Germany suffered damage from fighters and flak. The burden on repair establishments, replacement aircraft, and spare parts supply became intolerable. While the 8th Air Force battled the German day fighters, RAF Bomber Command was fighting a similar battle at night. For 10 long months in 1943, it attacked the German industrial heartland in the Ruhr. intense period was March through June when 26 heavy attacks were made. These included 
the famous Dam Buster raids. The Ruhr was hotly defended by flak and night fighters. It became evident to Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force that the German fighter force had to be destroyed if bombing operations were to continue. In May 1943, the date for the Allied invasion of France, Operation Overlord, was set for May 1st, 1944. This gave Bomber Harris and Ira Aker 12 months to accomplish the objectives of Operation Point Blank. Point Blank was the combined bomber offensive. Allied air superiority was essential if the invasion of France was to succeed. It was clear that air superiority could only be established if the Luftwaffe was forced to fight. This was only possible if the bombing of vital targets could be sustained. It meant that the 8th Air Force and Bomber Command had to throw themselves upon the German sword to blunt it. It would be a bloody and costly process. By the late spring of 1943, the Luftwaffe was increasing its strength. The number of fighters defending the Reich was growing. But there was a cost. Strengthening the Reich weakened air operations on the Eastern Front against Russia. Defending Germany against bombing attacks cost the Reich air superiority in Russia. And the concentration on production of fighters meant the virtual elimination of the Luftwaffe's bombing force. Operation Point Blank, the combined offensive by Bomber Command and the 8th Air Force, was directed against 76 targets. It was fully recognized that this wholesale attack was dependent on destroying German fighter strength either before or during the attack. The Luftwaffe was to be destroyed in the air, on the ground, and in the factories. General Aker began a faithful execution of the directive. Sir Arthur Harris continued on his own way. He was convinced that area bombing was still what was needed. Hamburg was Germany's second largest city. It was home to a major submarine base, an oil refinery, and more than 3,000 factories. The decision to bomb it was made when Sir Arthur Harris had been in command just over a year. In that year, his force had been largely equipped with four-engine bombers. Harris reluctantly agreed to the formation of what he called a Pathfinder Force. Two aircraft would use the G navigation system to lay down flares on either side of a target. Then other aircraft called illuminators would outline the target area in red flares. Finally, marker aircraft would drop in centuries to start fires in the target area. The biggest problem was that if the Pathfinders missed the target, everybody missed the target. Also, there was a tendency for each succeeding wave of bombers to drop early to avoid the flak. Gradually, the center of bombing would creep backwards, sometimes out of the target area. But Pathfinder techniques improved with experience. A master bomber was introduced to act as on-scene commander. And we'll direct the main force onto the aiming point. Four top to all crews, four top to all crews. Harris planned to drop 10,000 tons of bombs on Hamburg over a period of several days. He had an interesting new weapon up his sleeve, window. Window was the simplest of all electronic countermeasures. Small pieces of metal-coated paper or foil strips each showed up on German radar as a target. They confused enemy radar scopes and blinded them to the real targets, the bombers.
On the night of July 24, 1943, Harris launched 791 bombers against Hamburg. The first window was dropped by Pathfinder aircraft as they approached the German radar. It became impossible for the German radar operators to distinguish real from false targets. No meaningful directions could be given to the night fighters. Tons of explosive and incendiaries rained down. On the night of July the 27th, Bomber Command put 729 aircraft across Hamburg in 45 minutes. They dropped 1,200 tons of incendiaries. Many fires were still smoldering. The incendiaries combined with the weather to create a new phenomenon, the man-made firestorm. The multiple fires in Hamburg became a single holocaust. Temperatures reached 1,000 degrees Celsius. They created an enormous tornado of fire that uprooted huge trees, set street asphalt alight, and sucked human beings into the heart of the storm. As many as 50,000 people died. It was by far the worst bombing disaster of the war to date. Germany was shaken by a wave of horror. Albert Speer, Hitler's armaments minister, estimated that similar attacks on six more German cities would bring the war to a halt. But Adolf Hitler, the only man who could have changed things, was not moved by his people's suffering. He was confident that the German people would continue the war no matter what. He ordered Speer to straighten out the production problems, which he did. The people of Hamburg returned to work. Their morale did not break, even when Bomber Command struck again on July 29th. Fifty thousand people had been killed. Nine hundred thousand people were homeless. Thousands of buildings were destroyed. Yet the German people rallied quickly. After the war, it was estimated that the raids had cost Germany only two months' production from its Hamburg factories. And as the people recovered to fight on, so did the Luftwaffe. <laughs> 